Who seeks after God? Who seeks after God? No one. No, is that true? Please understand that. Now, Paul would write, we've been looking at this absolutely amazing transformation, this conversion of the Apostle Paul to Christianity, which is nothing short of miraculous. And there's no other miraculous conversion more astounding than that of the Apostle Paul. If you ever have any question whatsoever about the sovereign grace of God in election, predestination, then all you have to do is look at this ninth chapter of Acts, look at the life of Paul and who he was previously and who he became in an instant in time. And you know it's all the work of God in Christ alone. Amen? Amen. But look what he pens later on in the book of Romans chapter 3. Let's look at verse 10. As it is written... There is no, none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all turned aside. They have all together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb in their tongue. They have practiced deceit. Poison as of asp is under their lips whose mouth is wide and cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no one. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Who does that describe? Everyone before conversion. This is what Paul is talking about. If you really understand contextually what he's describing here is that whether it's a heathen who's lost in his sin, who's a slave mastered by his sin, or whether it's these religionists who are embracing a religious philosophy, believing that they can find acceptance before God by their works, all are lost, completely lost. True? Is that what Paul is presenting? And there's only one who can save. There's only one who can open up the heart and open up the mind to the truth that God has to reveal, right? To bring them to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, the gospel that Christ came to save us from the wrath of God. God came to save us from God to God. Amen? This transformation is what we're going to look at a little bit further in the life of Paul. But before we do, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Again, Paul describing... The transformation that takes place in the heart of a believer who comes to know the Lord through his sovereign act of grace. Chapter 6, 1 Corinthians. Verse 7. No, go to verse 9. Verse 9. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor homosexuals, nor sodomites, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners will inherit the kingdom of God. And what? Is that true? Yeah. yeah, we're outside of a relationship with God, outside of a communion with God. Could not in any way enter into a life-giving relationship with God except God allow it. For such were some of you, but, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ by... The Spirit of God. And that's what I want to present to you. As we've been looking at this ninth chapter of Acts, there's no doubt in my mind, and it should be no doubt in your mind, that salvation is a sovereign act of God alone. Philippians or Ephesians tells us as well that God has chosen us, God has predestined us, God has adopted us. God has redeemed us, God has washed us, God has sanctified us, God has cleansed us all according to his good pleasure. Amen? And when you see that for what it really is, the wretched sinner that we are and what a wonderful, merciful God he is, it changes everything in your life. And so it changed the Apostle Paul. So go with me now to Acts chapter 9. This man who was trying to promote a religion of works, wasn't he? It was not a, a religion of 
faith, justification by faith alone, but it was a religion of works. And in trying to justify this religious system that was so corrupt, we know that the Pharisees, the Pharisees were legalists trying to win approval before God by their works, a work salvation. Is that possible? No, nay, never. But at the same time, the Sadducees, the other half of the political party that existed in Jerusalem, they were a political organization with a religious front. How would you describe the Sadducees? Bad. Yeah, they were bad. They were bad. <laughs> No, they were a corrupt political organization. So Paul is trying to justify and promote this false religious system of Pharisaism, at the same time trying to defend this corrupt political party that gave him the authority and the power to go forward and to persecute the church the way he was. And all of a sudden, apart from any desire within him whatsoever, he's apprehended by the grace of God. The light that shone as brighter than the noonday sun. What was that light? Last week we looked at it. We said in Genesis 1, that light, light be, even before the sun or the moon or the stars, the cosmos was created, that light was Jesus Christ manifest. Not created, not born again, but he was manifest, wasn't he? That same light that John described in chapter 1 of John's gospel. He was the light who came into the world. And Jesus himself said in John chapter 8, I am the light of the world. Anyone who walks in darkness and believe in me shall have the light of life. And so that's the light that came into Paul's life. Let me pause for a moment. Good morning, Carl. How's Betsy doing? How's she doing with the news of her husband? Devastating, yeah, yeah. Carl's cousin uh, and her husband were struck by a car as they're crossing the street in Florida two days ago. He was killed, and she was hospitalized. And uh, so let's let's pray for that. What, what's what Betsy and what was her husband's name? Tom. 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 Tom's in glory. Tom a believer. Was Tom a believer? No, not that I'm aware. Oh, that's tragic. Father God, we, I just, uh, my heart goes out to Betsy right now, Lord. That sudden loss of her husband. Lord, I, I can't even imagine the pain that she is going through right now, Lord. Not just the pain of being injured in that accident, but the terrible loss of her husband. And so, Father, I just want to lift her up to you this morning, Lord. Be merciful, God. You are the father of all comfort who comforts us in all of our afflictions and trials. And so I pray, Father, you comfort her. Give her your peace, Lord, in the midst of this tragedy, a peace that makes no sense, though, but a peace that we can acquire in every circumstance, Lord. And use Carl and Jane to minister to her and the rest of the family in any way possible, Lord. And Lord, we do want to lift up Deborah Mano and the loss of her mom. But thank you. She's with you. She's ascended, Lord. She's not dead. She's alive. <laughs> and we thank you for that, Lord. And we ask that you be with Deb and the rest of the family as they are going to grieve this temporary loss, Lord. We, we grieve, Lord, nonetheless, but we don't grieve as those who have no hope. We have every hope, Lord. And we'll, we'll all be together one day forever and ever and ever, never, ever to be separated again. We thank you for that promise, Lord. So hear our prayer, we pray in your holy name. Amen. I'm, I'm sorry, my heart just went out to that situation. <clears throat> Talking about this salvation of Paul that took place, and there's no doubt in anybody's mind as he is trying to promote this false religious system of works, and he's trying to, uh, to support this corrupt political organization called the Sadducees, that he was in serious error. And he had such a hatred, say, a vehement hatred for the church of Jesus Christ, which he thought was some Nazarene her heretical sect that came about. And so he was single-handedly going to destroy it, hating Christ, hating Christians, hating the gospel. And then suddenly he's apprehended by that light, that life, that love of Jesus Christ. And once that takes place in the heart of a man or a woman, you will never, ever, 
ever be the same. Is that not true? Yeah, 43 years ago, and I can bear witness that I will never, ever, ever be the same person again. My life is continually changing, continually being shaped and conformed into his image. And we're going to see that's precisely what happened to the Apostle Paul. Everyone who's apprehended by the grace of God, their life will never, ever, ever stay the same. There'll be a transformation. You'll demonstrate the fruit of the Holy Spirit. And what is that fruit? Love, joy, peace, patience, gentleness, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self-control. Against such there is no law. Those nine wonderful adjectives describing the love and the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? Well, look at the text. Then Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked letters from the synagogues of Damascus, so that if he found any who were of the way, whether men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly a light shone around him from heaven. And he fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he said, Who are you, Lord? And then the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. It is hard for you to kick against the goads. So he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what would you have me to do? And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to the city, and it will be told you what you must do. And the men who journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing the voice, but seeing no one. And then Saul arose from the ground, and when his eyes were open, he saw no one. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and he neither ate nor drank. We looked at all of this last week. This transformation of Paul, this sudden change in this man's life. Was he instigating the change? Was he looking for the change? Was he seeking God? No, not at all. But God sought him out. And this one man's conversion is so miraculous. I, I don't know of another like it. Do you? I don't think anybody has ever had a conversion the way the Apostle Paul did, but for the purposes for which God had called this man to change the world, to be an, uh, an apostle unto the Gentiles, to share the gospel where it had never been shared before. Right? But look at the rest of the text. Look what transpires as he now knows clearly who Jesus is. The first thing that has to take place is you have to know who Jesus is clearly. Who are you, Lord? What's that word, Lord? Kurios. Kurios, the preeminent one, the prototokos of Colossians, the number one, right? First, in, and not in birth order, but first in preeminence. And you need to have a clear understanding that Jesus Christ is God, come in the flesh. John's gospel was written for the specific purpose, that gospel alone, to prove beyond a shadow of a doubt the deity of Jesus Christ. And every false religious system that exists now the biggest error that they make is with regard to the person of Jesus Christ. That he is fully man, but fully God at the same time, isn't he? God doing for us what we could never do for ourselves. You know, every other religious philosophy, every other ism is man's attempt at becoming God. But only Christianity does God come down and become man for our sake, to do for us what we could never, ever, ever do. So first of all, you have to have a clear understanding of who Jesus really is. Yahshua. Yah, Jehovah Shua, right? I am salvation is what it means. And using that name for God, I am continually in John's gospel declaring his deity. What would you have me to do is the next response. And so what does that indicate for us? He doesn't argue. He doesn't enter into an apology. He doesn't try to justify himself and what he was doing. Who are you, Lord? I'm Jesus, whom you're persecuting. What a shock that had to be to him. That the very object of his hatred was Jesus, the Savior, the Lord, Kurios of heaven and earth. And he doesn't try to justify himself. But what does he say? What would you have me to do? And was that a sign of? Submission. Submission. When you, when you have a clear understanding of who Jesus Christ is, you can't help but submit to him. He's God, you're not. He's divine, and you are the branches, right? <laughs> He's divine, you're not. Oh, and that's what happened to this man. So full of himself, but now, is, now God begins to empty him of Paul. Empty him of Saul. And fill him more with Jesus. Look at this. 
what would you have me to do? And he said, go into the city, and you'll be told what to do. Now go down to verse 10. God has all of this predetermined, right? By his own counsel of his own will, his sovereignty. Now there is a certain disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias. And he said, here I am, Lord. That's the only response that a servant should have for Jesus, no matter what he asks you to do, no matter what he tells you to do, no matter what you read in the word. We should respond to him in submission and say, Lord, here am I. Here am I, Lord. Use me. What do we know about Ananias? Tell me everything you know about Ananias. Good, because there's not much to know about Ananias. <laughs> We get, we get a little bit more of a description of Ananias. If you go to chapter 22 for a minute. Go to chapter 22. As Paul is rehearsing what had taken place to him, he's, he's constantly bringing to people's remembrance this conversion story, this transformation that occurred as he came to know Jesus. And, and do you do the same thing? I love telling people about my story, my conversion, how I came to meet the Savior. But it's a very simple story. One day I was one way, and then I met him. Yeah. And now I'm another way, completely different, following the way, the way of the Lord. Amen? Amen. But look at this man, Ananias. In chapter 22, Paul re rehearsing his transformation. Verse 12, then a certain Ananias, a devout man according to the law, having a good testimony with all the Jews who dwelt there, came to me. What do we know about him? He's a devout man following the law. Now, if you're following the law, what would be your understanding when you finally come to the realization of who Jesus is and the Messiah of Israel? He's the fulfillment of the law, and you're completed. All that the law represents in sign, in type, and symbol Okay, the whole Levitical system, the whole, all of the law is found in fulfillment and in reality and truth in Jesus Christ. And so this Ananias, although he embraced the law, when he came to the realization, as, as it was bore witness to him of the gospel of Jesus Christ, he realized that Jesus is the whole sacrificial system. Jesus is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He is that Pesach, the Passover. He's the burnt offering. He is the fulfillment of all that the law speaks of in type, symbol, sign. Do you understand that? And he did. A devout man now. Now, a completed Jew. Now, coming to the realization of who Jesus really is. Back to chapter 9, verse 10. Now, there was a certain disciple named, at Damascus, named Ananias. And to him, the Lord said in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Arise and go to a street called Straight. Go down Straight Street, right? What happened? You got saved? You turned right and you went straight. Is that true? <laughs> yeah, go down a street called Straight and inquire at the house of Judas for one called Saul of Tarsus. For behold, he is what? Oh, that's the, next, that's the next thing that happens when this transformation takes place. You see Jesus for who he truly is. You're going to submit your life to him. And then you're going to be in prayer constantly that, Lord, thy will be done. Lord, in every aspect of my life, every decision that I make, every action that I take, every word that I speak, Lord, may your will be done. Lord. Is that true? Are you men and women of prayer? Good. We're going to meet here tonight at 6 o'clock for prayer. I'd like to see most of you there. A man or woman of prayer, because this world desperately needs our prayers, our prayers that are inspired by the Spirit of God, praying through us for this lost generation, this lost and dying culture that we're in right now. Is that not true? So this man is in prayer, Jesus tells Ananias. What do you suppose that Paul was praying about? It's just conjecture on our part, speculation, but what would you think Paul was praying about? Some of his deeds. He hasn't eaten. He hasn't drinking a thing for three days. He's just consumed with the thoughts of what had happened to him. This transformation that took place. How he's been exposed to the light. What's he praying about? Understanding? Wisdom? Revelation? Forgiveness. Forgiveness? Guilt? Shame? What else is he praying about? I'm sorry? I can't hear you. His soul, yeah, his sight. Well, we know that uh, Paul will talk about his thorn in the flesh that he has. Now, we think that this is the beginning of that thorn in the flesh, that it was an Asian eye disease that he developed. Caused his sight. 
to be lost. But I don't think he's so concerned about that. Do you? I think he's so overwhelmed with the understanding that he's now received in who Jesus really is, the fulfillment of all of the promises that the Old Testament makes with regard to the Meshach Nagi, the Messiah, the King. That he's absolutely amazed. And I think in his mind, because he had such a grasp of the Old Testament, like no other rabbi, Rabbi Saul, and he had such a grasp of the Old Testament, the promises that were in the Old Testament of the law, and now all of a sudden, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's making all these wonderful connections. Everything is fitting together, all the puzzle pieces, and it's painting such a beautiful picture of the salvation that comes through the Messiah of Israel. I think that's what he's praying about, too. Understanding the grace that has been given to him undeservingly. Oh. Seeing Jesus for who he really is. Submitting now to that Lord. And becoming a man of prayer. Because prayer changes things. Doesn't prayer change things, Eric? Oh, yeah. You gave testimony of that a couple weeks ago, didn't you? Prayer changes things, beloved. Do you believe that? You know why men and women don't pray? Don't pray? Because they don't believe it. They don't believe that prayer changes things. And what changes more than anything else when you go to God in prayer? You. You do. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that amazing? We go to God expecting him to change the situation or change somebody else, and what happens? We get changed. Yeah. Yes. The Lord said to him, go, for he's a chosen vessel of mine. He's praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him so that he might receive his sight. Then Ananias said, Lord, you're making a serious error in judgment here, Lord. You know. Now, this, this is early on in the life of the church, isn't it? But, but many of the believers had to flee to Damascus. Where's Damascus? Syria. Syria, north, outside of the land of Israel. And so many Jews had to flee to Damascus to, to flee the persecution that had came. And, and now they heard word of this Paul and what Paul was doing and how he was coming to Damascus to persecute more of the church. And he said, Lord, you don't understand. We know of this man, the chief persecutor single-handedly trying to destroy the church as we've been looking at the last couple of weeks. Oh, but what a difference it'll make when apprehended by the grace of God, by the truth of God's word, and suddenly the chief persecutor is going to become the chief persecuted, isn't he? Yeah. I told you in uh, AD 66, what happened? 20,000 believers, Messianic Jews, were killed in Damascus because of their faith in Christ, Jesus as their Messiah. So Paul, and I said, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how, he har how the harm he has done to your saints, Hagios in Jerusalem. What's Hagios? Most holy ones. Does the church have to declare you sainthood? No, no. How do you become a saint? I'm sorry? How do you become a saint? The indwelling of the Holy Spirit of God, the Hagios of God, the Holy One of God, right? The, when the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you, He makes you a saint. The Hagios is the most holy ones. Not because we are, but because He is, right? And living a holy, righteous, godly life, what's required? Simply allowing Him to live His life through you. Do you want to live your life, or do you want to let Him live your life? Nevertheless, thy will be done, Father, right? Just as Jesus displayed for us. And that's what it means to live a holy life. Everyone who's a believer in Jesus Christ, everyone who's dwelt by the Holy Spirit of God is a saint. Only two classes of people now, right, Jay? Saints and ain'ts. That's it. <laughs> yes. Yes, what he's done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority from the chief priests, from the corrupt political leadership, to bind all who call upon your name. All who stand against abortion, all who believe that marriage is with one man, one woman, one biological man, one biological woman, till death do them part. And they become enemies of the state, haven't we? Do you understand that? They consider you a domestic terrorist because of what you believe. The state. Hmm. Amazing. What's changed? What's changed in the world? Nothing. Nothing has changed, No. Yes, he has authority from the chief priest, this corrupt political leadership, to bind all who call upon your name. But the Lord said to him, go. Go, for he is what? Oh. Paul didn't choose? Who chose? 
Salvation unilateral, monogenistic, synergistic. Salvation. What's it mean to be synergistic? That you both have to agree. Two parties involved. Is it synergistic or is it monogenistic? Your salvation. One. One. One person chooses. Who chooses? He does. You know, you got to convince people is to pray that God would choose them, to call them to become his sons, his daughters, to come into his family. Hmm. Is that not true? Did you choose God or God chose you? Think back. If you really do and you pause for a moment, you think about your salvation, you realize it had nothing to do, everything to do with him. He chose. We talked about adoption last week. What's so beautiful about adoption? Knowing everything that he knows about me, he still chose me. I wouldn't choose me, knowing what I know about me. Don't laugh. You wouldn't either. I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about you. <laughs> yeah. He's a chosen vessel of mine to bear my name before Gentiles, kings, the children of Israel. Wow. What kings? What, what, uh, what, in what opportunities did Paul have to speak truth to power? Name some. Who? King Agrippa. Okay, who else? Festus. Who else? The cat. What's his name? Felix. Felix the cat. <laughs> the governors. Festus. Felix. King Agrippa. Who else? Who? Nero. Yeah, Nero. Sergius Paulus. Remember Sergius Paulus? The proconsul in Malta where he got shipwrecked? So all of this was fulfilled. Paul did speak to Gentiles, to kings, to authorities, to the children of people of Israel. And you know what? He's still speaking to you and I today, isn't he? I love this man. I am so thankful for his conversion. I think the Apostle Paul has more to do with my discipleship, my formation of Christ in me than any other man, dead or living. Well, he's not dead, is he? No, he's alive. What do you think of the Apostle Paul? I think he's the greatest Christian that's ever lived. I don't think anybody had a better understanding of the grace of God than did the Apostle Paul. What's your opinion? Hmm? That's maybe why God chose him, to use him as that example for us. Yes, a chosen vessel of mine to speak to kings, the children of Israel, to Gentiles, and I will show him the many things he must what? Oh, wait a minute. I didn't sign up for that. I hate suffering. I think I got a dentist appointment this week. Fortunately, it's just a cleaning. But if they, I don't know, if something's gone wrong as I'm aging, you know, maybe they're going to have to do something more than that, and I hate going to, do you hate going to the dentist? Oh, boy. Yeah, I don't like pain. I don't like suffering. And the Bible says that we're given the gift of God to suffer long. Oh, don't you hate coupling those two words together? Suffer long? To be long suffering? Oh, no. How about short suffering? Yeah, we got <laughs> I'm with you, sister. Yeah, I'm vertically challenged, too. <laughs> Oh, but who wants to suffer? But we listen, we never learn more than in our experience of suffering. Never. Anybody can go through the good times, can't they? Yeah, and still be happy with the Lord. Hmm? But you go through the suffering when God doesn't meet your expectations, when God doesn't answer the prayers the way you want them answered. And there's this pain and this suffering and this grief and this sorrow that comes into your life. Now, how do you process all of that? I must show him the many things he must suffer, and nobody has suffered more for the cause of Christ, I believe, than the, the Apostle Paul. He gives us an understanding of some of that suffering, doesn't he? Where? In the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn there. Keep your place in 9, Acts 9. Go to 2 Corinthians. When you suffer, what's the question you should ask yourself that you believe God is asking you? I'm sorry, what did you say, Pat? What's the purpose? What's the purpose? Okay, that's always a good question, but sometimes he doesn't give me the answer. You know, all things do work together for good. All things? Is, 
all might be all, suffering, pain, sorrow, separation. And sometimes we may not understand it for some time. We may never understand it until we get to heaven. Well, a two-word response. What is it? Of course. 17 years, and it took me 16 years to see the good in him taking my first wife. Now I can say all things work together for good. But it took me that long to see the good. What else should we ask ourselves? What would God be asking you as he takes you through any particular suffering? Grace to be able to go through the suffering. What did you say? Was he trying to teach you? You know what God says to all of us clearly when we go through that suffering? Can I trust you? Can I trust you, my son? Can I trust you, my daughter, with this suffering that I'm allowing to come into your life for my purposes that at this time you may not even understand? But this suffering is to mature you, to perfect you, and to glorify my name. All suffering that a believer goes, not, listen, nothing is wasted in God's economy. Is that true? Nothing. Nothing is ever wasted. God is sovereign. And any suffering that he brings us through as his sons and daughters, there's always a divine purpose. Now, he alone sometimes knows what that purpose is, for he's all wise. Father knows best, doesn't he? And so he simply asks the question, can I, can I trust you? Can I trust you with this suffering I'm going to bring into your life? Will you still be faithful? Will I still be found good in your eyes, in your heart, in your mind? Will you still worship me? Will you still love me? The great physician has a suffering prescribed for every single one of us in this sanctuary this morning. You know that? He has to. Why? To perfect you, to mature you. Oh, I must show him the many things he must suffer. And he goes on to give us a list of some of that suffering, but it's not all inclusive because as we go through the book of Acts and we see what Paul has experienced, there's some sufferings he doesn't mention here. But let's look and see what he does mention, this suffering that he had to go through because of Christ and his love for Christ and his service to Christ. Let's go look to uh, chapter 11, beginning in uh, verse he, 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 first of all, he doesn't want to boast, right? But he said, if I must boast, I'll boast in my infirmities and my sufferings for Christ. Boy, that's so unusual for today, isn't it? Hmm. But look at verse 22. He's talking about the Judaizers who were coming in and trying to destroy Paul's reputation, slandering him, this uh, assassination of his character. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they of the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more. And now he's going to validate his apostleship, validate that he's a minister of Christ. What does he say? In more labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequently. In deaths, often. From the Jews, five times, 40 stripes minus one. What should that have done to him? It should have killed him. 39 stripes. Wow. Five times. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils in the water, perils among robbers, perils among my own countrymen, perils among the Gentiles, perils of the city, perils in the wilderness, perils in the sea, perils among false brethren. Why in the world am I doing this? <laughs> Come on, we're not even through half the list yet. And be honest. Without the supernatural empowerment of the Holy Spirit, we'd all quit this job. <laughs> right? Yeah. Look what it goes on to say. Perils in the city, perils in the wilderness, perils at sea, perils among false brethren, in weariness and in toil and sleeplessness, often in hunger and thirst and fastings, often in cold and nakedness, besides all the other things which come upon me daily. What? My number one concern is what? For God's children, my brothers and sisters in the faith. Is that your primary concern? You're honest about it? Who are you most concerned about in this world? Me. Me. <laughs> come on, come on, be honest. But as you're growing in Christ and you're developing more and more a Christ-likeness, you have, you have a deep concern for others, and especially those of the body of Christ, those of our family. When they hurt, you hurt with them. When they rejoice, you rejoice. When they cry, you cry. Why? Because we're all one now. We're so connected. Hmm. 
my deep concern for the ecclesia, for the called out assembly, primarily who at this time? Jews, primarily Jews at this time. So you see, when you read the church, word church, so often we Gentiles, as soon as we read the word church, we think of Gentiles, non-Jews. No, no, no. He's speaking of the Jews. The Jewish believers who have completed Jews, perfected Jews, who believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel, that was his deep concern for the suffering that they're going through and the persecution that they're experiencing. Are you concerned about the suffering? Do you even, are you even aware of the suffering and the persecution that's going on in the body of Christ throughout the rest of the world? Yeah. It's getting worse. and It's not better and better. No, 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 no. The persecution of Christians is getting far worse in this world. Satan is ramping up his persecution of the Jews of Israel and the church, the body of Christ. Is that not true? Is that not alarming to you when we see the growth of anti-Semitism in our own nation? Unbelievable, the people in New York City that are, that are protesting, standing for the Houthis in Yemen. Does that not amaze you? It's one thing when they're pro-Palestinian. Okay, okay, so they, they're, just, they're, they're just misinformed. They're ignorant. But now they're standing up for the Houthis in Yemen? An Iranian-backed terrorist organization, blatantly? Hmm. Amazing. Who is weak? Am I not weak? Who is made to stumble? Do I not burn with indignation? For if I boast, I will boast in the things which concern my infirmity. For the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is blessed forevermore, knows that I am not lying. In Damascus, the governor, under Artis, the king, was guarding the city of Damascus with the garrison, desiring to arrest me. But when I was let down in a basket through a window in the wall, I escaped from his hands. Way to go, the great apostle Paul, right? He was going to ride into the city, and he was going to be a conqueror. He was going to destroy Christianity. And now they've got to hide him in a basket and drop him down under the wall. He's got to escape at night. What a privileged position. Wouldn't you envy the Apostle Paul? Wouldn't you like to be God's servant the way the Apostle Paul was God's servant? Not treated like royalty, not treated like power and authority. No, scorned, humiliated. Look at uh, verse 7 of chapter 12. 2 Corinthians 12, 7. At least I should be exalted above measure. Why should it be exalted above measure? What did he say previously? Revelation. Revelation. Revelation of what? He was taken to heaven. All right, go to, go to chapter 12, verse 1. It is doubtless and profitable for me not to boast, but I will come to visions and revelations of the Lord. I know a man in Christ for 14 years ago, whether in the body I do not know, or whether out of the body I do not know. God knows such a man was caught up to the third heaven. Harpazo, caught up. What does that mean? Snatched away. It's where the Latin Vulgate translate that word rapturo, which is where we get the word rapture. You waiting for that? Yes. Mm. Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Where's the third heaven? Where God dwells, right? The first heaven? First heaven is the outer atmosphere. Now above the, what is it, the stratosphere? Then there's the heaven of heavens, right? And then the third heaven is where God dwells. It's the spiritual realm. Paul was caught up to the third heaven. Amazing. And I know such a man, whether in the body, out of the body, I do not know. God knows how he was caught up to paradise and heard inexpressible words, which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Of such a one I will not boast. Yet I'm of I, myself I will not boast except in my infirmities. Now, who's the man he's talking about? It was himself. He was caught up. And he was caught up and he saw heaven and all of heaven's glory. And what did he say? It would be criminal. It would be criminal for me to try to describe it. Why? It's indescribable. What are some of the indescribable things that we know of in the Bible? His love. How do you, how do you, how do you really fully express and describe the love of God? Inexpressible. His peace. Inexpressible. Wow. Joy. But it all can be experienced. Right? Hard to explain. I, I can remember when I was apprehended by the light, trying to explain to my family what happened to me. You know, who drives the farthest to come to church here? Terry and Glenn, maybe? How far do they drive? 
How far do you drive, Terry? Glenn? Uh, you mean uh, Eric? Eric and Terry? No. Oh, Hollins. Hollins, where are you? They're away today. They're away today. About an hour drive. Oh, see, they couldn't make the drive. Okay. Something absolutely wonderful was happening to me when I was apprehended by the light. And the only church that I could go to that was embracing what I believed at that time was in Canandaigua, New York, Lake Canandaigua. You know where that is? Now, I lived in Schenectady, New York. Do you know where that is? How far is that? How far are they apart from each other, Carl? About 200 miles, 200 plus miles. I would drive 200 plus miles to go to church, Carl. Got to be out of my mind, right? Bill, Bill Gallatin was worth it. The, the Holy Spirit was worth it. It was the Holy Spirit's presence. He was doing something absolutely wonderful. But, but my family thought I was completely losing my mind. Driving to, hey, a church alive is worth, what's a couple hundred miles? Spending it with the Lord, four hours back, four hours, four hours there, four hours back, spending the time with the Lord, just enjoying the Lord and basking in the sunshine of his word and his love for me. Those days were absolutely incredible. Well worth my time. Well worth the drive, you see. There's no inconvenience there. But my, my first wife, she got off the map in New York State, and she said, well, you live here, you're going here, and you can't, you tell me you can't find a church from there to there that you're happy with? It's inexplicable. I cannot explain to you what's happening to me. I can't explain to you the love that has entered into my life, the understanding, the light, the joy. I can't explain to you. I'm a, I'm a different person now. Suddenly, I walked in the woods in West Glenville, New York, just outside of Saratoga, one way, wretched, blind, Naked, miserable, and I came out another way. Wow. And the day I surrendered, as he was exposing himself to me, never the same. Paul would never, ever, ever be the same. And he said, if I were to try to describe to you what heaven is like, it'd be criminal. I couldn't do it justice. It's really difficult to describe the love of God, isn't it? Yeah. And that's what he's referring to here. Yes, of such a one, I will, I will boast. Yet of myself, I'll boast except in my infirmities. Verse 6, chapter 12. For though I might desire to boast, I will not be a fool. For I will speak the truth, but I refrain. Least anyone should think of me above what he sees me to be or hears from me. What are we? Paul said, I'm the, I'm the greatest of sinners. He's the least to be an apostle. We are the things that rocks dream about. What is that? Yeah. Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. And, you, and Christ is? Every, is that true of your life? Is that, is that true? Does the people who know you best, do they know that, that you really are humbled by your experience with Christ? That seeing Jesus for who he truly is? And submitting your life to him and recognizing the forgiveness and the grace that has come into your life all by his choice, it humbles us, doesn't it? There's, there's no place for boasting. There's no place for pride anymore. And Paul, Paul could have boasted and said, I'm the man. God took me to heaven. Amazing. But then he talks about his infirmities. Here we go again, chapter 12, verse 7. Least I should be exalted above measure by the abundance of the revelation, a thorn in the flesh was given to me, a messenger of Satan to buffet me. Least I be exalted above measure. Concerning this thing, I pleaded with the Lord three times that it might depart from me. And the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient. For my strength is made perfect in weakness. Is that true? Yeah, what, what, what do you do when the Lord says, no, 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 I don't want to take this from you. I'm going to, listen, I'm going to allow you to be strengthened through all of this. How many? David, do you remember Larry Moore? Do you remember Larry Moore? Sarah Moore's daddy. Oh, yes. Yeah. 
Larry Moore was a very successful guy. He was an Air Force pilot in the Air Force, came out of the Air Force. How many of you know Larry Moore or Sarah Moore? Anybody? There's a few of us. Okay. He was an Air Force pilot, uh, very successful in the Air Force, came out of the Air Force, ran three different car dealerships, very successful businessman in the area. Uh, his, his wife was a uh, devout Christian. She taught precepts ministry. Uh, he was okay. You know, he was, I mean, you wouldn't consider him a Christian because there wasn't any fruit that you'd speak of. He might claim to be a Christian, but uh, self-made man. And self-made men, they worship their creator who? Self. Self. Self-made men worship their creator, self. But she was out on a speaking engagement for the weekend, and Larry had sugar diabetes. And he fell out of his bed, broke his neck. And for eight hours, he lay on the floor with a broken neck. So for the rest of his life, what do you think happened to him? He was paralyzed from the neck down. And being a veteran, he was down in Augusta, Georgia, at the hospital there, and I went down to visit with him. He angry, bitter man. Whew. This, this man so full of himself, so full of pride. You know, and I've said so many times before, you know, if you're being oppressed by demons, if an unbeliever is possessed by a demon, you know, we have power to do something about that, don't we? Yeah. Yes, we can. By the name of Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit that resides within us, right? But if a man or a woman is full of himself, what can we do? Yeah. Nothing. Yeah. Nothing. Only God can deal with that. God has to empty that man or that woman of himself, Right? And so that's what God was doing with Larry. All, thing, all things work together for good. Is that not true? And so I went down to visit Larry, and I, I told Larry, I said, Larry, uh, this bitterness will destroy you far more than this accident, far more than you being in this wheelchair. And I said, you need to let go of this bitterness. I heard of a story once of a man who was in New Orleans, and this preacher was preaching in New Orleans. And it was hot. There wasn't any air conditioning at the time. You know, don't we love climate control? And so all the doors were open, the windows in the church were open, and it was a street beggar who lost both his legs, and he was on a board, and the board had wheels, and he just go around on his knuckles. And he even could negotiate stairs. And he heard this preacher preaching a revival. And he worked his way up the stairs, and he traveled down the aisle, and he screamed at the preacher, and he said, how could God use half a man? And the preacher so wisely, epinosis. What's epinosis? Knowledge that falls upon you, right? Comes upon you. The preacher said, God can use half a man with a whole heart more than he can use a whole man with half a heart. Is that not true? And that's why I told Larry that day. I said, Larry, God has left intact the only way we experience God right now. How do we experience God? With our mind and our heart. Larry, you still have your mind, you still have your heart, and God wants you to experience him in such a way that you'll be thanking him for what happened. Oh, he got mad at me. I think he was going to throw his food tray at me. <laughs> and I said, Larry, just think about what I'm telling you. And we prayed, and I left, and he was angry. And it was some years later, he was up on his platform in his wheelchair thanking God for what happened to him. Wow. Praising God that all things work together because he experienced God inexplicably. Can't be explained, but he experienced Jesus Christ like never before in his mind, in his heart, in his person. It's true. God can use half a man with a whole heart far more than he can use a whole man with half a heart. If you look at the first three kings of Israel, who are they? Do you know how to understand those three? Saul, no heart for God. David, a whole heart for God. Solomon, half a heart for God. Yeah. No, Paul is saying, in my infirmities, I'll boast of my relationship with the Lord through the sufferings that I have gone through for Christ's sake. Mm. My grace is sufficient. Therefore, most gladly, I would rather boast in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities. <laughs> of your mind. Pleasure? <laughs> what did Peter say? We count it all joy when we suffer various trials. You see, that if you really are truly resting in the Lord and, not, and understanding his sovereignty in your life, you can experience godliness and contentment in every and all situations. Is that not true? Yeah. 
Yes, I take pleasure in infirmities, reproaches, and needs, and persecutions, and distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then I am... Oh, yeah. Gives us a prayer life, too, doesn't it? We, well, listen, as life goes on, you want to make sure that God provides the circumstances such that you find your full dependence, your strength, your sufficiency in him and him alone. The f- sufficiency of his word and the sufficiency of his purpose, his person, for all of his purposes to be fulfilled in our lives. Amen? Do you understand that? Are you sufficient in his word? Yes. Are you sufficient in this person? Back to the text, chapter 9. Yes, I must show him the many things he must suffer for my name's sake. And Ananias went his way, entered the house, and laying his hands on him, said to him, Wow, what a change. Lord, you, you, don't, you, don't, Lord, you don't know this guy. You don't, you don't know the things I've heard about this guy. He's the most unlikely person we would ever expect to come to know you, Lord. To love you, Lord, to worship you, Lord, to serve you, Lord. And, and now, what, what, how that, how that had it to comfort Paul? Paul gets this vision, this understanding from God that this devout servant of the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come to him and lay hands upon him. But what's the first thing he says to him? Brother, brother, family, one, kindred. So important, isn't it, that we're family? Chico, how long have we known each other, Chico? 30 years. I love you, my brother. You're more my brother than my biological brothers have ever been. Do you know that? That kindred that we have. When when I call him brother, it means so much to me and to him. When we call one another brother, sister, we're family. We're the children of the same father. Isn't that wonderful? Brothers and sisters are we. Brother Saul. How that had to warm his heart. He must have felt so separated from God. So separated from God's people as a result of what he was doing. Paul, single-handedly, the other writings of the period tell us, is responsible for as many as 10,000 believers. Jewish believers in Jesus the Messiah being imprisoned, persecuted, or murdered. And this is a murderer who suddenly receives the grace of God, the forgiveness of God. If Paul can be forgiven of all that he has done, what have you done that you can't be forgiven of? What is it when a person continually brings up their past? Oh, God can't forgive me of this. And I bring up the fact that God forgave the apostle Paul and used him so mightily when all of the pain, the suffering, and the sorrow that he caused the early church, the early believers... In Jesus and Messiah? What is it that he can't forgive? Why would they wallow in all of that? Why would there be such deep regret that prevents them from really going on in joy and serving the Lord? What's their focus on? Themselves. You don't understand. You don't understand who I am. You don't understand I'm the wretch that I am. I am so bad. I'm not like any other man. I'm unique. Yeah, just like your fingerprints. Unique. Just like everybody else. Is that right? That's your uniqueness. Right? Just like everybody else. The thief on the cross. Did he need more grace than Billy Graham? No. 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 God's grace is so marvelous, so wonderful, and so transforming that none of us who come to Christ should ever wallow in deep regret over our past because he has washed all of that away. But such were some of you. But you were washed. You were sanctified. You are justified in the Lord Jesus Christ. Is that not true? Leave the past where it belongs. In the past, any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things become. Every morning, the mercies are new. Amen? Yeah, brother Saul, the Lord Jesus has appeared to you on the road as you came, and he sent me that you might receive your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, like a flakes is the word there in the Greek text. And he received his sight at once, and he arose and he was baptized. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Now, wait a minute. When did Paul receive the Holy Spirit? On the road. On the road, 
When did you receive the Holy Spirit? The moment of conversion, the moment that God came into your life. Now, when did you receive the filling of the Holy Spirit? Daily, there should be a daily filling, be filled, and that's a constant filling. Wouldn't you like to fill up the truck one time and never have to do it again, you know? Have you ever been filled with the Holy Spirit? The purpose of the indwelling of the Spirit, the Holy Spirit that comes to dwell within you, is to bring about salvation. The purpose of the filling of the Holy Spirit is for what? Equip for ministry. Paul, my Spirit is going to equip you to go through all of the suffering that I predetermined you're going to suffer and to accomplish all that I purposed for you to accomplish as the apostle to the Gentiles, to open up the world, to change the world for the gospel. Now, what's your ministry? Does God have a ministry for every single one of us here in the sanctuary? Yes. Does God have a ministry for every single one of us here in the sanctuary? Yes. Yes. Now, what's required for you to be able to fulfill that ministry is the epi, with how the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You know, I've taught you this before. If you go through John's Gospel, chapters 13, 14, 15, 16, talking about the work of the Holy Spirit, Jesus' more extensive teaching on the work of His Spirit in the life of the believer... He said, the first thing that happens is the Holy Spirit comes alongside you. Parakaletos, right? The comfort, to come alongside. And what is he doing as he comes alongside you? I'm sorry? He's drawing you to Christ. He's opening your mind and your heart to the person of Jesus Christ. The Holy Spirit is the best friend of Jesus. What does he come to do? Bear witness of Jesus. What's his name? We don't know. He hasn't told us his name. Maybe we'll learn in heaven. But we know he's the Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of God, Spirit of Christ. And he's come to lead us, mentor us into all truth. And the truth he wants to bring us into is the person of Jesus Christ. Everyone who goes to hell goes to hell because they deny the person of Jesus Christ, right? Now, you go to hell because you're a sinner. Let me correct something I said last week. If Jesus never came, was never born, never lived a perfectly sin-free life, never died for us and never ascended up into heaven, none of that ever, ever happened. What happens to every man, woman, and child? Why? Because they're by nature children of wrath. You're sinners. You're sinners. Okay? Now, now the only way to be saved is to accept Jesus Christ. And the only unpardonable sin. What's the one unpardonable sin? Rejecting the witness of the Holy Spirit with regard to the person of Jesus Christ. He's come to bear witness. Now, that's what he does. The paracletos, when he comes alongside you, he's bearing witness of who Jesus is. You have to know it was only he who opened my eyes. Only he who opened my mind. Only he who opened my heart to see who Jesus really was. Isn't that true? Isn't that true of you? Now, now, once you get to that place where he's come alongside you and he's accomplished his purposes, his will, in election, in predestination, in adoption, and you open up your heart and your mind and your life to Christ, what happens? He comes to dwell in you, right? E-N is the Greek preposition, like our English word, I-N. Now, at the time of your salvation, the Holy Spirit, you can't be saved without the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in you. Now he's got another work he wants to do. And sometimes it happens at the same time. Sometimes it's sometime after. He wants to now empower you. Jesus said to his disciples after he breathed upon them in John 21, right? And they received the Holy Spirit. He said, now tarry in Jerusalem until you do the power from on high. I got a job for every one of you. Every one of you have ministry. Every one of you have purpose. But you need to be empowered for that purpose. You need to have my dunamis, right? My energio. Makrektos, the power that he talks about in Ephesians, that multiplied uh, manifold power of God working in our life to accomplish his will, his purposes, his ministry. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon you, tarry in Jerusalem until the Spirit has come upon you with power from on high. The purpose for ministry. Now, how many of you have experienced that, that empowering for ministry? In a few minutes, we're going to pray for a family that's going down to Belize. You know where Belize is? Yeah. North of Belize is Mexico. Right? West of Belize is Guatemala. South of Belize is Honduras. That's where it's located. So they're going down to Belize. God has called them to be missionaries. Sold this business, given up everything. Now, as a family, they're going to go down and serve the Lord. You have to be empowered to do that. You have to have the Holy Spirit's guidance to do that. Only the Holy Spirit could bring a man or a woman to do that. You understand? That's the filling. Receive now the Holy Spirit, Paul. That empowerment, that fulfilling. Have you received that? Do you know what your ministry is? Do you know what your calling is? 
Are you fulfilling your calling? Now, Miss Roberta will tell you, uh, Miss Roberta, I'm sorry, Miss Gail, the two of you are just one for me. <laughs> I love you. Miss Gail will tell you, every Sunday morning, I am as nervous as a cat on a hot tin roof to get up here and share the word with you. Who's sufficient for the who, who can do an adequate job? It's certainly at least not me. But I know God's called me to it, so I do it. Paul says, I'll be a fool for Christ's sake. I'll be a fool for Christ's sake as well. But I'm thankful for the empowering that he gives me, the love that he's given me for his word, the ability to remember so much of his word, the ability to articulate it to some point where you understand it, where it relates to you who are here. Have you had that feeling? Have you had that empowerment? Or are you still waiting for that to take place? How does it take place? Submission. Paul was submitted to the will of God. Three days, three nights, he ate nothing. Submitted himself to God in prayer. Whatever you have for me, God, I am so sorry for what I have been. I'm so sorry for who I am. But now change me, God, and use me for your glory, Lord. Wow. Look at the text. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, immediately there fell from his eyes something like scales, and he received his sight at once, and he arose, and he was baptized. Now, that's the next thing that happens with a believer. They want to be baptized. Why do they want to be baptized? Does baptism save you? You sure? There are a lot of people who are baptized aren't saved. A lot of people have water baptism, but they never receive the baptizer of the Holy Spirit. Isn't that true? Yeah, well, water baptism doesn't save you. But what is water baptism a purpose of? You're professing your faith in Christ to the world. Jesus said in uh, Matthew's gospel, if you'll confess me before men, then I will confess you before my fathers in heaven. What's that word, confession? Homo legeo. It's the word for the year. Homo legeo. Be of the same word, the same mind, same thought, same life. What's the repent? What's the word repent? Metanoia. What does it mean? Change your thinking. Change your thinking. None of no, 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 this has to do with feelings. You understand that? Feelings, nothing more than feelings, trying to forget mine, right? Because feelings will get you in trouble. Metanoia, to repent, means to change your thinking through the word of God. Change your thinking. And then to confess, homo legeo, means, means that you agree with God. Homo, same, logos, the word. The same, same word, you agree with. Same life, you agree with. Same person, you agree with. The, everything that the Bible has to say, you agree. And as that takes place, you want to be baptized to display to the world that you're confessing Christ. Homo legeo. One and the same, me and Jesus. Is that true? Mm. Now, if you've never been baptized, you need to consider that and talk to me. It's not that cold outside. We've set up a baptism right there at times. If you've never been baptized, that's a problem. Why is that a problem? Don't you want to live a completely obedient life to Christ? Now, baptism doesn't save you, it doesn't. But Jesus has commanded that you're to believe, repent, and be baptized. Baptism is not required for salvation, but baptism is required to live a perfectly submitted life to Christ. What happened to the Ethiopian eunuch? As soon as Philip explained to him all that Isaiah had to say, what did he say? What forbids me from being baptized? I'm Damon's goods. But you're saying God is going to make me whole? And I want the world to know. And he was baptized. Paul now receives his sight. He was blind, but now he sees so clearly, spiritually, I want to be baptized. You know, I, I, I question whether a person should take communion who's never been obedient to baptism. Simply because you're not being obedient to the Lord. But wait a minute, baptism? Okay. How about some other issues that you know you should not be or should be doing or not doing in obedience to God and his word? Are you homo legeo? If you will confess me before me, if you'll live my life here now before men, I'm going to confess to the Father, you belong to me. We're one and the same. Right? The high priest of the prayer of Jesus, John 17, what did he say? Father, Father, make them one. As, as you and I are one, Father, make them one in me and one in us, that we all may be one. Well, I've got to ask you that question. Are, are you one with him? 
One with him means you're living the life that he would have you live. Actually, he's living his life through you in obedience to his word. Now, where in his word are you not living in obedience or in harmony with that word? Now that, you gotta, you gotta just stop it. Just, <laughs> how do I just stop it? The power of the Holy Spirit. Listen, he never takes anything from you, does he? We didn't take an offering this morning? Did we take an offering last week? The week before? Do we ever take an offering? We've never taken an offering? What's wrong with us? Gosh. Why? Because God doesn't take anything from you. He receives what you offer. Now, in that area of your disobedience, in that area of your rebellion, if you truly will recognize it for what it is, how it's hindering you from being able to be empowered to be all that he wants you to be in this life, all you, all you have to do, all that's required is you offer it to him. You can't do anything about it. Paul goes to great length in Romans 6 and 7 describing that we are slaves of sin. Is that true? Yes. Were you not a slave of sin? And as a slave of sin, who controlled your life? Sin. And who controlled you? Satan. You were mastered. You were mastered by your sin. You were mastered by Satan. You were mastered by your flesh. What could you do about it? Nothing. Nothing. Paul makes it very clear. Those things I will not to do, I do. Those things I will to do, I do not. O oh, wretched man that I am, who will save me? And chapter 8 is all about. Chapter 8 is all about, Romans. Chapter 8 is all about the Holy Spirit. For seven chapters, we're all getting lost. That's what he does to us in Romans. The first seven chapters, man, you are nothing but a wretch. You are the thing rocks dream about. You are the thing that God reached down into that septic tank and pulled it out and shook it up and said, wow, watch this. <laughs> Thank you, young man. Is that not true? Absolutely true. Oh, but how he wants to use it. Oh, listen, all you have to do is offer it to him, whatever that is. You know the besetting sin. You know, oh, Father, I'm sorry. i got to come here. Can I? You've never offered it to me. It's your precious, precious. Right? And, and why is it such a dark, deep secret of sin? Because you keep it in the dark. You don't bring it out into the light of day. It's all that's required. Hate it. Surrender it, offer it, and he'll take it. And then say, Lord, change me, empower me. This murderer, chief among sinners, offered himself unreservedly, without question. Lord, here I am, take me, Lord, use me. And wow. In our contemporary age, there's a milk farmer's boy who did that. His theology and education was milk and cows. Working out in the barn, shoveling, you know what? And who was that? And he became the greatest evangelist of our time. If you've never been up to the Billy Graham Library in Charlotte, North Carolina, you need to go up to the Billy Graham Library. You'll be, I've, every time I've gone, I don't know how many times I've been there now, maybe a dozen times. And every time I go through there, I'm absolutely amazed at how God has used this milk farmer's son to touch the world. Equally and even in a greater way, amazed at how God used this murderer, the apostle Paul, Saul of Tarsus, to turn the world right side up. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. Ah, next week, we'll continue on.